All right. Well, here we are with Elaine Ash. And Ellen Marie Francisco. Well, let's talk about you, though, because you're the editor extraordinaire. And uh, you've saved my butt a couple times for sure. And I'm sure you have a reputation for doing that. So <laughs> well, thank you. First Ellen. you kick us in the butt and then you save our butt. <laughs> <laughs> right. I kick you in the butt to save your butt. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so I'm, um, I'm a novel editor, right? Books. Ellen, we met at a book event out in San Bernardino. We did. And you were promoting your book. Good Girl's Guide to County Jail. I was carrying this book around San Bernardino, wondering who I could pawn it off to, who I could sell it to, who I could. That's not true. You I were invited know. as a respected author to the, um, what was it? The, the San Bernardino Library. And, and the, the writers group. The writers group I, invited both of us out there. And uh, I fell in love the minute I saw you and saw your book. Did you? Oh, that's yes, good. I did. <laughs> we together, and then we started working together. And so your follow-up to Good Girl's Guide is I Stand Corrected. Right, which and is so the book you've you helped help me on. Yes, that. exactly. And then we get to the novel, which is? Catastrophic Expectations, Sex, Love, and the Pursuit of Marriage. Which I have a copy and of that around here. And it. Uh, book deal so fast that my head spun the manuscript wasn't even finished and the publisher wanted it so that kicked us off on quite an adventure <laughs> that quick yeah that kicked started our calendar that's for sure in yeah. fact um but well, i think what you wanted me go, go ahead yeah I, the thing with um catastrophic was that yeah, I just woke up and thought I need to pitch this, you know, and I didn't really stop to think about it at all. I just picked up the phone. I got the publisher, you know, like that and pitched both books, the, the fiction and the nonfiction. And they looked at both and they decided to do catastrophic because it was a fiction, obviously. And they, they wanted to, uh, they liked I Stand Corrected, but they, you know, they were sticking to fiction. The thing about that book and the thing about Ellen's writing is always her voice and to preserve that voice. And I'm, you know, once you get to know me, you realize that I, I love copy editors. We need copy editors, but we also have to push back a little sometimes when they try to edit out a particular voice. You and know Ellen what? has a very distinctive writing voice that needed kid gloves to preserve it and not to mess it up you know what and that is a really true point because it was the first time I'd ever worked with a copy editor and I had assumptions going in I just assumed that it would go a certain way and it did I, I got a lot of emails asking me to take out some of the funniest parts in the book and some of the parts that I thought were the truest indication of who the character was at her core. So it was, and, and what was really stressful, I mean, I think it would have been five times more stressful if I didn't have you, you know, in my well, ear. Exactly, I was, I was on the, the receiving end of these phone calls. Help, what do you think of this change? What should I do? And see, I've been to this rodeo many times <laughs> and I know how to, coach a writer through it um, because you don't want to fight with your publisher and your copy editor, never. You want to keep them friends, but you also need to preserve your voice because if you lose that, there's your writing career. And you're just one book to them, mm -hmm. but this is your career and you need to stand up for yourself when it's necessary. Yeah, 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 it's true. So. And then, I mean, thankfully, the, the whole process is designed so that the author can decide whether to accept changes or not. But, but there was a lot of pressure for it. So, yeah, you definitely helped me um, kind of build a backbone so that I, I didn't cave so easily, you know, because I think if, if I had just heard 
their perspective of what needed to happen and not yours as well, then I would have been um, easily overpowered. I would have kind of gone along. I would have succumbed, you know, or something. I think dreadful would have happened. <laughs> well, all's, all's well that ends well. We made it through and I've made it through with many writers. You know, I've had um, peculiar, quirky little manuscripts with great voices come back rewritten by overzealous copy editors. And uh, I'm well suited to fighting those battles. Uh, knowing how to, how to parse it and, and letting the writer describe why my voice is, is, is correct and why it's grammatically correct, even though it may have um, quirks in the dialogue or a twist of phrase or whatever, you know, Modern commercial novels do not have to be by the high school English paper, you know? They're what evokes emotion and gets readers excited and intrigued. And sometimes um, busy copy editors that are, maybe they've been, maybe they're freelance, maybe they've been hauled in off a, a white paper or something more strictly grammatical, onto a novel and it takes them a little while to get into the groove. So you need to know how to talk to them and explain to them why this voice that to them looks incorrect is actually not incorrect at all. It's getting across the character, mm -hmm. which is the soul of the novel. Yeah. Yeah. And in my, in the case of catastrophic expectations, we, I mean, <laughs> it's told through yeah, yeah the um it's told through the eyes of us basically a sex crazed caterer so she has a relationship with food as much as she has a relationship with people you know you're in her head you're reading her thoughts basically and yeah so i didn't really want to dumb those down or take them out at all i mean do you ever have instances where people try to mix voice in a book and you've got to educate them on hey you can't change perspectives halfway through or there's usually the voice doesn't change because it's the way the writer works there are voices that could use a little work um sometimes writers need to feel more confident to really put the colorful the color of their natural conversation onto the page. That takes a while to get to learn to be confident. Oh my gosh, I have one writer um, who is writing a memoir, Kevin, Kevin Melton, <laughs> who is writing red bite marks on my cinnamon skin. Ooh. Yes, and it's a memoir uh, of being a young gay man and uh, he got involved with some dicey situations. And uh, he is just so colorful in the way he relates everything. And he's not, he's not pushing his lifestyle. He's actually showing how he came to be the more mature individual that he is now. It's a wonderful book. We're working on a second round of edits. And um, he is just like the original, the novel originally had some flat, dull title I don't even want to tell you it because it was so bad and I said this is a wonderful book with the worst title in the world and I found that phrase in his manuscript that said red bite marks on my cinnamon skin and I said that's the title that's it right there and and so it was drawing his personality and his color out to really um make that thing sing you know uh -huh. yeah he's gonna get a deal I know that's sweet. That sounds good. I would read it based on the title, you know. I mean, that's kind of how I titled Good Girl's Guide to County Jail, you, you know, and then I, oh, struck out, then I struck out the good. I mean, we were sitting, we were sitting in jail discussing what the title was going to be because we knew, I knew that I was writing the book because I was so mad at what was going on in there. But um, Good Girl's and Guide to County Jail. Well, Right now, we should just have a little aside that you were in jail because you had a very traumatic brain injury from which you have since healed. And you so you went from law abiding citizen to having a brush with the law that landed you in jail. And once you healed and were diagnosed correctly, 
you're on the other side now. So I just want everybody to know that. Yeah, true enough. At least for the most part, I'm on the other side. <laughs> Still a bad girl in us all, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> <laughs> but that book, uh, Good Girl's Guide to County Jail, uh, is a guide to, if you have a brush with the law, it's, there's millions of women that need to read that book. Well, it's, it's also just a little, yeah, I mean, I wrote it with the idea that I was taking you by the hand and I was walking you through everything from a warrant all the way through to God forbid, whatever your, you know, preliminary hearings were and your trials, hopefully not. And then yes, definitely your release, you know, so and and it was no holds barred. I mean, I didn't really it packs a punch because it, it was so real, you know, and I interviewed so many girls in there too, who were going through similar things that I could relate to um, because of what I was going through. And a lot of people who didn't get a fair shake. So yeah, I mean, somebody had to do something about that, but the memoir portion of it, you know, was much more personal and I've held that back for um, publishing because I, you know, there was just parts of it that I wasn't ready to face. And it was a really hard thing to, even though I wrote a lot of it while I was in jail, it was a really hard thing to, um, go back and revisit, which is, I think, you know, the beauty in having your help in that process um, was incredibly invaluable because there were huge parts that because I was not wanting to approach certain subject matter, there were huge chunks missing out of the book, right? And, um, and had I not, you know, had you help me with that, I think I would still be I think I would be selling the wrong product, you know, and I think I would be trying to publish the wrong, the wrong work. And, um, and you that's, know, that's a recurring thing that personal challenge just for you <clears throat> is that Ellen is writing such unique material that <clears throat> she can get in the middle of a manuscript and say, you know what, I think I'm headed in the wrong direction. I'm not sure of the book that I'm writing here. And that does happen to pioneers. I'm a pioneer in my bestseller metrics. So I know this process of finding your way, feeling your way forward. And that's a, that's a perfectly okay thing to do, you know, yeah. to feel your way through a manuscript and to get lost and to need help getting back on the right track. Mm -hmm. um, it really shows that you are committed to making that book be honest. Mm -hmm. And there was a point too where I think I think this happens with every writer where you're so far into the work you cannot see it. It's the forest for the trees dilemma. So it, it was good. It's always good to have that exterior voice who's got the fresh perspective, who doesn't, who isn't invested in it like you are, but is more neutral as a result and can give you, um, you know, really good direction on where where it needs to go and where the focus is. Because I think that you know, I mean, that's what you did, right? Like you went through the whole thing. You're like, hey, you're missing, you're missing all the stuff about your your private life and what was going on day to day. You know, you're only talking about the problem here. Round it out a little bit. So, you know, that yeah, was really. Was, <clears throat> I wanted to know, hey, what's doing with your family while you're in jail? Um, what's happening with your boss? What's happening with your friends, people that you know? And that was sort of missing. And of course, when you're writing something that's very close to the heart and is a trauma, mm -hmm. it's easy to miss those things. It's Well, it, I had to miss them because I, I, they were so painful. I mean, really what was happening for me when I was in there um, was, you know, somebody that I had trusted my business to was, was really being disloyal. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, the, the nail was already in the coffin because I was behind bars to begin with, but, you know, cause my credibility obviously took a huge hit and, but they were really like stealing my business out from under me at the same time that I was trying to work it from the inside of jail. And it was really painful. And I knew that it was going on at the time. I couldn't do anything about it. Um, there was such carnage when I got out, there was nothing left of my career. Like it was literally just, you know, debris and, um, the really? effort. That I would, oh just, yeah. Oh, it, I mean, try to be a realtor and not return a phone call. You know what I mean? I mean, I was in for two months. I see. Right. I, I mean, everything, every, 
every property I had on the market, every, everything was suffering. My, I had a, you know, vacation rental business. So it was a nightmare. And, um, and then I had this guy who knew very little about me running around doing all this very personal stuff, like going through all my files and gathering them up for my lawyer so he could figure out what's an angle here that we can get this girl who's never been in trouble off the hook. And, you know, um, yeah, so there were huge pockets that I just, and I mean, even, even though I was determined to get the book out, I already got Good Girls Guide out. So I knew, okay, I can't let too many years go by, right? But I still had this emotional thing to get over. And, um, and I forced myself over the course of one whole summer that I was going to go in, I was going to fill in those blanks, I was going to, you know, do what I could, but I was literally still nauseous every time I sat down to it. So it was not a fun book to work on. But, you know, and even uh, a very emotional, valuable right? book, a very valuable book, one that others can very much benefit from. So it was worth, it, it's all, it's all worth it. And let's talk about some guidelines for taking feedback and changes because boy, do I have some anecdotes on that one. Because mm -hmm. um, I was easy to work with, right? I mean, I was. Oh yeah, very easy to work with. Yeah, but you know, it's important when you're starting out to be careful where you take feedback from. You don't take it from anywhere. There you go. Um, you only want to take feedback from people who are real fans of your genre, who really know it. So if you're writing a romance, you only want feedback from romance writers. Because if you give it to a bunch of hard-boiled crime readers, they're going to say, well, there's no blood and guts. I'm disappointed. And you'll be rewriting that thing to the end of time, you know? Oh, God. <laughs> so, yeah. so be careful <clears throat> of who you take. Don't take candy from strangers. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, um, when you get feedback um, from an editor, if you don't agree, try it on a beta reader. And after a while, you'll start to see the same stuff comes up again and again in feedback. And that's when you know, you know, if two or three people tell you you're drunk, you have to sit down. And mm -hmm. that's how you know when you should change stuff. Um, changes are hard, they're, they're difficult, um, but you know, this, the, this attitude of every word is sacred, <laughs> it does, certain people do feel that way. And, um, and we know it's not. <laughs> And they end up self-published and they sell three copies. Um, now, self-publishing, I'm a big fan of self-publishing, but it still has to be a professional quality book if it's going to sell. It, you know, what publicity does for books is it gives it a little initial push. Yeah. But if people aren't crazy about that book and start to talk about it, it goes nowhere. And a lot of people don't understand that all entertainment, films and books and all this kind of stuff are sold by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. They do have commercials and they do have publicity, but if people aren't talking about it saying, wow, all of this novel catastrophic expectations, it's so funny and the voice is so great. Um, if people aren't saying that, it, it won't take off no matter how good the commercials are. Mm -hmm. And I can tell who's gonna sell with, you know, that is something I can tell from when I, look at a manuscript. I mean, it's no mistake that this publisher jumped on the manuscript of catastrophic expectations right away. There's no, there's no uh, doubt in my mind of why he did that. And then our, uh, our challenge was to really make sure that everything was on the page that needed to be there. And you had a few too many characters in the beginning, I, if I recall. Mm -hmm. We had to whittle a few people out of there mm -hmm. uh, because there was just too many people to, under, to, to figure out. And there were a few, there were instances where some of the character names were too similar. Like there were little things, you know, where, yes. you, where yes. when you're That's working on the important. story and you're getting all the little details in, you don't pay too, too, too much attention to. But when the problems get ironed out and you start doing those read-throughs, 
with fewer problems, then the few that are left become very loud problems, you know, and, and you, you caught a lot of, I mean, yeah, maybe talk about what you thought was, you know, what it needed. I mean, you saw it, you saw it after it was already sold. And I was waiting to get the editorial notes. So you and I were scrambling to, oh, my God, let's see what we need to do to this thing before it's too late. Yeah, well, you were. Um, oh God, pressure was on. <laughs> they wanted to publish it so fast, right? Like, who does? Like, yeah. I mean, that was just uncanny. It was just unheard of, right? No agent, a direct phone call. It was like, okay, let's do this. Everything you don't do. That that's right. Is what what happened. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I noticed was we were in Los Angeles. We were in a certain time period. And uh, you, there were some visuals that were lacking. So you had this wonderful little catering truck that was covered with uh, lipstick Lip kisses, was yeah. it? Um, and because her catering company is called Lip Service in the book. And uh, I wanted uh, a wide shot to use a cinematic term, a film term. I wanted a wide shot of that little truck trundling down the, the PCH, PCH the, you know. the Coast Highway in California on her way yeah. to a, a catering gig. And I wanted a wide shot of that. So you understood what the wide shot, the, the concept of the wide shot. And I am, con I am always finding that in manuscripts. It's wonderful to start a chapter, some chapters, with a wide shot. Set the scene, describe where we are, the mm -hmm. setting. You know, in films, they have what they call the wide shot, which you'll see the whole beach, all the palm trees, the truck, everything. Right. Then they'll go into the close-ups. Right. But we never forget where these characters are. They're standing on the beach beside this mm -hmm. lucky mm -hmm. little, little truck. Right. And, uh, you know, a novel is a movie in the mind. Mm -hmm. Everything is in the words. If it's not on the page, the reader doesn't see it. And so that's something that I often have to do um, because writers are seeing this movie as they write in their own minds. And they are often not aware that a lot of that description has not made it onto the page. Well, those wide shots were needed at the beginning of the book. And I was doing very, very, um, you know, in like internalized scenes, you know, where you were right in it because she was intimate and she wanted to get into everything, you know? So, so that was a good thing too. And it also, and it was cute because it wasn't like you said, oh, I need you to do this, this, and this. You just said, give me, give me a wider shot. Give me a little bit of what a world looks like. And then I could work with what was already on the page, what I wanted you to know about the character, you know, and I made it like, okay, suddenly there was a bumper sticker and it was like, honk, if you love whatever. I can't even remember what it was. I put something in, you know, but even that wide shot gave more of an, view of to what kind of a character she is you know what she's like on the road you know she's like waving at people and blowing kisses you know and stuff like that yeah, so that yeah so it, very cute uh -huh. would have liked more time in development right like uh, i mean i'll never do that again no, like for it, sure telling you how not to uh -huh. <laughs> not to land a book deal right the book hasn't been edited it's really not ready you send the manuscript of course the thing is she picked up the phone and the publisher uh, got on the phone and insisted that she send the manuscript now. Then I get a call from Ellen. Well, what am I supposed to do? I said, you can't keep him waiting. You've got to send it off and tell him that we're working on it. And so that's what you did. Yeah. And the contract, you know, came seven days later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so this time for sure, I'm finishing Moon Over Mandeville before I shop it at all, before I hand it in. I mean, they have a first right of refusal for it, thank God. So that's obviously a great motivator to get in and, and get some unfinished things finished and reworked. And, you know, and, and I think, too, I'm less invested in how how the story needs to look. I, I'm going to work with what I've got and make it the best story it can be, basically, and just cut to the chase and get it done instead of... I think also I had to come to terms with the fact that but, you know, there were there's a there was a part of me that didn't really want to let my work go, you know, for a lot of years. Right? Who Which has is, ever heard of that before? So once you start <laughs> to break down those barriers to yourself. I suffer from it myself. 
the the, yeah. the, the, the little knuckles just don't want to let go. No, I can, I can make it more perfect. And I like to start things, you know, I like to start things. I don't really like to end them. I don't like endings and, and sad goodbyes and things like that. So why not string a bunch of characters around for 30 years and just let them drop wherever they land, you know? So when I'm now, now I have to tell you, I have never had an editor because, you know, I write under a pen name. I write crime under a pen name, I, Anonymous Nine. I have never sold or had anything acquired that the editor didn't have to say, it's time to step away from the manuscript, Elaine. Wow. And they have to lead me away. Right. And you know what? What was nice about going through the editorial process with the publisher as well as you was, you know, I had two very determined professionals being very diplomatic in their approach, you know, not with kit gloves. I mean, because I, I was approachable, but I mean, I, you guys had to make sure that I got out of my way in order for the story to be told. And the process was brilliant because, you know, there were things that you noticed and that she noticed and we're back to, you know, when more than one person calls out some flaws, they're flaws, they're not, you know, things to, to skim over. So it was a really valuable, valuable experience to have both, you know, contingencies working. And uh, what else was there in that process that I thought was interesting? Um, but she had, she had done the same thing. She was like, you know, basically anything that isn't driving the story forward needs to not be in it anymore. And there wasn't too much that we had to take out, but there were, you know. It was pretty streamlined, yeah. It was pretty streamlined, but I thought it was great, you know. So, anyway, I, it was a quite a quite a whirlwind, and uh, yeah. So we'll take the time we need on Moon. Yeah. So thanks for, you know, being you because my God, like your talents are immense, and <sighs> right. I mean, and it's so great because you have such a good tie-in with you know how story really is supposed to work and where it all goes that you know you can instantly it's like you can hear it you know you don't even have to read it you can just hear it off the page like oh page 39 this has got to go you know <laughs> whatever it is well, you know my my great talent is to be able to I read it like a reader I know what the readers are thinking and I know how fast or slow if the inf the thing has to go in order for them to really get it and understand it because you know the kiss of death is when people put down a manuscript after 10 pages and say well i can't really follow it i'm a little confused i'm not really sure about what's going on you know th those are the things you when you hear that you know that there is something uh wrong not with the information and not with the story but with the way that you're relaying mm -hmm. the information sometimes it's out of order so all right well anything else you want to see thrilled to be with you okay excellent <laughs>